Robert Pattinson, starring in a second chance breakout role. You, you're impossibly strong and rich. You know who I am. You mean you're... Say it. Say it out loud. The vampire Batman? Are you afraid? No, I'm not scared. I'd say you can bite me, but I know you can literally be bummed by your back. Well, you're literally the bane of my existence. Well, just so you know, I am Dean Jacob. No! 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 That's right, I'm Jacob Green. No! No! He's a wolf! Starring Robert Pattinson as the pale-skinned Batman Vampire Knight. And in the breakout most stellar performance, already Oscar-nominated role, is the above-average show as the extremely handsome, well-built, so sexy, Bane. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another mini episode of the Above Average Show Show. And today we've got a special guest, someone that I've known since I think the third or fourth set that I worked on, um, one of my friends, Paul Barlow. Paul, welcome to the show. Hi, Joe. Great to be here. I'm excited to, uh, first of all, always get to talk to you and uh, also get to brag about myself, which, <laughs> as other people know, I never do. Ever. Never. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you've you've got one of the most interesting stories from your first day on set that it's like a one in a billion chance of this happening, which is one of the reasons that I wanted you on the show, which is one of the reasons you also mentioned, hey, I want to be on the show. (laughs) So we both had the same thing in mind. And it's a set that we both worked on, which I thought was interesting that I completely forgot about because you were on one side of the set and I was on the other. But... Why don't you go ahead and fill us in on your very first project and what you did and what happened? Okay, so I was um, I was losing a sales job, my real sales job, and and I looked on Facebook, and you know I needed to make money because even if I went out and saw a client in my sales job, I knew I wasn't going to get paid my commission because I was getting canned in a couple weeks, and I saw this thing about being an extra on Facebook, you know, and I thought, oh, this is baloney. They probably want me to pay them money or something. But I called them up, and uh, I had on my suit and tie. I was just sitting in Chick-fil-A looking at the Internet, doing nothing basically during the day instead of being out selling, you know, just dressing the part. And so I, they said, well, come on in and for a fitting for this movie, The Change Up. And I said, okay. So I went in there, and they said, yeah, you look like you could play a grumpy old lawyer. And I thought, wow, that's great. I look grumpy <laughs> and old. And... Um, so they said, well, we're going to film on Saturdays and Sundays. And I thought, okay, that's perfect because I still have to pretend I'm doing my job. And so I went in there and uh, the changeup. And I thought it was a baseball movie, you know, a changeup, a left-handed pitcher. But anyway. That totally makes sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm standing in this hallway with a bunch of extras. Everybody else is going in. I'm like the second person left. And I thought, God, this is like the seventh grade dance. I'm just standing around doing nothing. Then they bring out this woman who I guess was smiling too much, um, Sandy Harrison, who's you know certainly a good friend of mine since, since her son William Harrison is a very successful actor. Anyway, I guess and they took me in and they put me in this seat at this law table for this scene. And I'm like, okay, this looks pretty good. We're going to be close in. Maybe I'll be seen in this film. I didn't know anything about being an extra, about a principal. I didn't even know who was in a film. <laughs> and they kept saying, well, Jason is going to sit here. Jason is going to sit here. I'm like, Jason, thinking to myself, Jason who? This scene is a body-switching comedy, and, and he's messing up this big uh, law firm's merger, as I found out. But anyway, they get ready to film, and, and they say, bring in the first team. And the first team, here comes Jason Bateman walking in the room and I'm like holy cow and I'm in a seat right next to him I mean about a foot away from Jason Bateman and that's my first time ever on a set but it was crazy because um you know usually an extra they even told us don't look at him just you know kind of be the furniture but I had to look at him (laughs) because the boss the boss was on the other side of him and we had to just look at the boss 
And so Jason started improv and because it's like a body switching comedy. He's handing me a Coke. He's handing me chips. So I had to react. So I was always known in high school for making crazy faces and being an idiot and a clown. And uh, <laughs> so I just started making faces at, you know, what he was doing and reacting, probably overreacting because I didn't know what I was doing. And the director comes out, David Dobkin, and he goes, you. And he's pointing to me, and I'm like, oh, my God, now I'm losing an $8 an hour. I don't know what I'm doing. And he goes, you're terrific. Keep doing that. And I'm like, okay. And so then I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm going to be seen. And So I made faces and all this stuff, and they kept it all. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, um, you know, we, we worked um, Saturdays, Sundays, a couple weekends, and then they had this big Thanksgiving a scene right around Thanksgiving on a Monday or Tuesday, the week of Thanksgiving. And there was hundreds of extras, and I got my wife recruited to play my wife, but I wasn't going to be able to do it because I had my regular job, and we had a big Monday morning meeting, and I was supposed they wanted me on set. They said, you got to be here. you got to be here, you know, because I was one of the main lawyers in all these scenes. Luckily, my Monday morning meeting got canceled because everybody was already out of town for Thanksgiving, the other salespeople. So I went into work, you know, and uh, that was when... On those two days, they ended up the last night. They pointed at four of us. They had us all say lines. And uh, so I got lines my very first time out, which was insane. And I didn't even know what it meant, money-wise or anything. And Jonathan <laughs> McGarity, the, the, the AD, points at you know, He goes, uh, I said to him, I said, Jonathan, what does this mean? As we're signing the SAG contracts and all this stuff, you know. And uh, and he goes, oh, you're going to get like 750 now. You get 750 later, and then you get money the rest of your life. And now I was known for making my faces. You know, I had even had close-ups where I'm making a face. And I said, you want to know what my reaction is to that? And he, and he looked at me like he didn't know what I was going to do. And I jumped up and I hugged him. I said, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and the other funny thing with it, Joe, is um, my kids had been teasing me. Because I said, you know, I'm in all these scenes. I'm like close-up. I'm always talking to Jason Bateman. You know, between takes, he's talking to me. And I said, I might get lines in this thing. So my kids were... Just, just, just became teenagers. We're, we're kidding me every day. Daddy thinks he's going to get lines. Daddy thinks he's going to get lines. <laughs> and so the last night when I got my lines, you know, it was it was late at night, but they were old enough to be home by themselves. And I woke them up. We, we you know, it was late at night, and I said, "Guess who got lines?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they were all excited. But it was it was crazy. I mean, there's so many things happened because of that. It, it was it was a you know, still probably the best thing I've ever done, even though I've been, you know, part-time acting for 10 years since. <laughs> <laughs> and the lines were at the dinner party, right? Yes, at the dinner party, Ryan Reynolds comes in and kisses Leslie Mann. Ryan Reynolds is, you know, the guy he switched bodies with, and everybody's like, us grumpy old lawyers are like, you know, what is going on? So they had me do three different versions. Uh, all of us got to do lines. They only kept my line and one other guy's lines, and they kept two of my lines, which was amazing. Yay. One of them was funny, and the audience laughs, and it's like, is he kissing the wrong woman? <laughs> but the other versions they had me do was, holy moly, and uh, I don't understand this. But, I mean, the, it looked good, and I made a face and say the line, and the audience in the theater laughed, and I almost wet myself. You know? <laughs> so, But uh, like, it took all my control not to jump up and say, that's me. But I did it somehow and so kept my seat. But it was cool. Really just an amazing, unbelievable adventure. You know, and the fact that I've been bumped up twice since then in other movies from an extra to a uh, That's going to say, is, is you got miraculous. bumped up in The Watch also. What? Tell us that story. Well, in The Watch, it was funny because um, the day before I was working this other thing. Um, so I called up um, Rose and she said, yeah, you know, we should. I said, do you have anything for tomorrow? Because now I was unemployed. I was available all the time. But uh, she goes, yeah, remember that? There was this scene where we wanted you on this town council. Can you still do it? And I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. So I went, and in the morning, I was on this city council thing for the watch. Uh, ben Stiller was two seats away from me. And during one of the takes, I guess I'm supposed to be like uh, the head of the town council or the mayor or something. I didn't think that much of it. The woman next to me had never been extra work before, and I thought she was like panicking. <laughs> she realized she was going to be next to Ben Stiller, and I was like, "Just calm down." I said, "You never know. You, you know, they may he may ask you a question. Just be ready to say something if he does." And what happens is he turns to me and asks me something, and and I had to answer, you know. And so uh, I just, you know, it's supposed to be this really boring town council meeting where nobody's paying attention, and and he made up some fact about playgrounds in 1932, and he goes. 
what do you think about that, Harvey? And so I just made this totally bored face, and I turned to him, and I said, whatever. That was it. <laughs> that was my big line. And, um, and he repeated it right away. He goes, whatever. That's your answer, Harvey, whatever. So in my mind, I'm thinking, cool, cool. I think I'm going to get bumped up again here. You know, still, I'm still a novice. That was maybe the seventh project I've done. Still don't know what the heck I'm doing. It, it, you know, I got it. So I got bumped up again. So I was, again, miraculously lucky. You're there three hours. And that's one thing that a lot of people probably don't know, that if you go from background to an upgrade like that to a speaking role, that as soon as you do, if you're booked for, say, 10 days and they bump you up on day one, they have to pay you the high SAG rate for the remaining nine days, regardless if you're speaking those days or not. Or if you get bumped up on day seven, it's four days. This one, I guess because of, um, you know, when it got settled, that was fine. Yeah. And, And that was... You know, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I was visible in any of the other scenes or anything. And, yeah. But yeah, I didn't know that either. So that's why, that's why typically you're right, Joe. If they give you lines, like even if they know they're going to reward, like my friends on Anchorman, when they got Anchorman 2, they gave them the lines the last day because they, you know, it was kind of a, a present for them for being such good uh, workers and all. Yeah. But you, you're right. If, if they would have got bumped up earlier, every day they would have gotten a SAG rate. And so the productions just can't afford that. Yeah. You know. So, so typically upgrades will happen on that very last day and they'll plan right. them for that day. <laughs> right, right. Like on a change up, there was four, four of us, four or five of us lawyers that were like all oh, these close in scenes. And, and uh, one of them was really a lawyer and, and they, rewarded all of us gave us all the lines in that party seat but they just didn't use the other guys lines they used two of mine and and one other person so it was it's incredibly lucky it's 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 a weird profession so god and then those were all a few years ago but recently you got lines on venom you know in, in venom what happened was i had a i just standing there i didn't even know the movie was venom when i went on set i thought okay what is this And then they say, oh, it's a Marvel movie. Oh, it's Venom. And I'm like, cool, cool. I'm going to be an extra in a Marvel movie because what male, American male, wouldn't want to be in a Marvel movie? And so we're doing this scene, and the guy says, you know, this scene doesn't act right. You, sir, what's your name? And he points to me. And I'm like, my name's Paul Barlow. And he goes, "Uh, here's what I want you to say. And they gave me a line where these kids are getting on a bus after a field trip. And so we're we're not getting on the bus. We're in the museum you know, ending, ending our little uh, tour. And so, uh, the guy, so he said, say something like, all right, kids, um, you know, time to get on the bus. So I improv and I said, all right, kids, you know, it's getting a straight line. It's time to get on the bus. And he said, that's perfect. And the director was, uh, was it Ruben Fletcher? I believe of Venom. That sounds uh, right. Yeah. But anyway, he goes, that's great. And then, so I did it over and over and over. And, um, uh, on that one, you know, I, I kind of, he still thought I wasn't going to get upgraded because I thought, okay, I'm just really like cotton. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but I mean, almost immediately after the first take, uh, um, the PAs came over, you know, took my social security number and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, I got upgraded again. Thank you, Santa. This is the greatest <laughs> Christmas present ever. It was a week before Christmas. And, uh, but then, you know, you wait a year and a half and the film finally comes out. They cut it. I thought it was kind of a throwaway line. They did cut it from the scene, but I am seen for if you look really close, half a second out of focus as that <laughs> scene is ending. And so, I, even though they cut me out of the credits, which hurt because you want that on your resume, yeah. and they, you know, they, um, uh, you know, I didn't get to say my line on screen. I still get the residuals. I, I thought I didn't think I was going to, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a couple months ago, you know, I got a residual check for Venom. So I'm like, cool. So nice. I have three films. I get money from all the time. So. I'll have to go back and rewatch and go frame by frame and see if I can spot yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's where he gives this little girl a little medal, and they're on a, they, this tour. Yeah. And, like, right after he gives it, she says, hey, guys, look, uh, he won the res, res, Rizomet wanders off with the other person to go look at a package he just got. And that was right when I was like, okay, kids, let's get on the bus, get in line. But they cut it. And I kind of knew. You know, by now, because I've done so many things, it was like sort of a throwaway line. But, you know, you're hoping against hope that you get to um, that you get to have, be seen online and things. So yeah, and you I'm never a, know. I'm a, I'm a tiny, microscopic, maybe one atom particle of the Marvel Universe. <laughs> so, but, uh, <laughs> and it's funny, the only other things, you know, I've won other parts in movies, actually got on Actors, actors Access, won the movie roles and everything. 
those uh, I never even get uh, credits for or residuals. The only ones I think I've gotten upgraded, the ones that I've gotten upgraded for is the one I get residuals for. The ones I've actually earned, I've been like completely cut out of the film, not in the credits and no residuals. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. What a weird career. Huh. So, yeah. Yeah, um, it's it's so strange how all of that works. <laughs> yeah, bizarre. Oh, goodness. And we're going to take a little bit of a left-hand turn here and switch from movies. And I want to talk to you a little bit about some stuff that you do in your personal life that's very interesting. <laughs> because yeah, right. you You'd are the... You're looking at my windows, huh? So, <laughs> no, I want to talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> you are the only competitive eater that I know of personally. <laughs> <laughs> and after watching Kobayashi race a bear on eating a hundred hot dogs on Man vs. Animal, right. had me fascinated. And then I found out that you were a competitive eater. I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Tell us yeah, about like, the world of competitive eating and what you do to prepare for that. Well, you know, I, I, I finally stopped doing it, but for 10 years I was world ranked in the top 50 in competitive eating. And I mean, compared to like Kobayashi and those guys, I eat. On a good day, I'll eat about a third of what they eat, but I can eat more than a normal human. And um, so what um, What I used to do is, you know, and, and all these guys, I mean, Kobayashi trains with the uh, Japanese Olympians, not anymore because he lives in New York, but um, I've got to talk to him a few times. And, of course, Joey Chestnut, who's the world champion hot dog eater. But they're all runners. They're all weightlifters. They all have incredible metabolism. Some of them. Like the uh, thin Korean lady, um, Sonia Thomas, the Black Widow, they just have like these freakish metabolisms where they can just eat so much stuff. And then, you know, and then they can eat afterwards. Like I've been in contests with Sonia where afterwards she's like, let's go get ice cream right after she ate 57 or 82 crystals. And I, I ate about 20 something, which was, you know, for me, amazing. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you know, you just you just go running. I mean, when I was kind of taking it i never take anything too serious but when i was kind of trying to at least put up decent amounts of uh of eating i would go running the whole week you eat a lot of you eat a lot of stuff and you also drink a lot of liquids to um, try to stretch your stomach they say but the, i'm nothing like the guys that are just you know fantastic at it to me half of it was they kept me ranked because um, I was good at promoting the stuff. Like I'd be on radio shows and local TV shows, and I know how to uh, speak in quick sentences, promote the contest, and, you know, act like an idiot, which they really <laughs> want on TV and radio. So. And then what do you do after you're done with the contest? And well, you're, like, completely full. Is there anything that you do to wind down? Is there anything you do to digest? Do you take some fiber pills? Do you just kind of wait it all out until it does its due process? Or Well, I mean... Yeah, pretty much for me, I, I you know, even my maximum, like some of the things where I've really had some good tolls, it's, I'm just completely full of nothing like the other guys, you know, where you just like eat this stuff. Mine sound like something that is humanly possible, my totals. The other guys, they're things like, no, nobody can do that. Um, but, um, so, but those guys are okay too, again, because they have these metabolisms that are just ridiculous. I mean, I ate... A uh, 13-pound pizza. I shared it with another guy. The Carnivore Challenge. Wow. The second guy's ever to do it. Me and all that. And uh, it was funny because he's a Gator. I'm a Seminole. You know, in college, <laughs> so we're supposed to be mortal enemies, but we work together. And he's a great guy, really smart guy. And uh, we ate this Carnivore Challenge, 13-pound pizza, and we ate later that night. You know, we just. Uh, but I mean, some of those guys, I will say this, if they want to go out and party like immediately afterwards, which they usually do because you only get to see them a couple times a year, they will purge, you would might call it afterwards. But but they can hold it down. It's just a matter of do they want to make room for more partying or, you know, just let it digest. But like after I ate the 13 pound pizza, you know, we were fine and we ate and the next day I weighed pretty much the same because my metabolism was just going like nuts in there. I went out for a run and I weighed the same as I did the day before, which is crazy. So, so if you eat that for lunch, do you not eat the rest of the day then? Or do you get hungry by dinner time and have another snack? Or Well, yeah. I mean, almost everybody does. You know, it's, a, it's amazing. The, the, especially, like I say, the, the, what's more amazing is the, the totals they eat and then they eat later. There's one guy older than me that does it, Rich Lefevre. Um, he, I swear to God, if they had a 24 marathon of eating, he would win. Because he, he just is always hungry. He'll eat, 
he was in this crystal hamburger contest. He ate 57 or something like that. You know, he finished because even though that's impossible, he finished about seventh. But, wow. um, but we went to this party afterwards. I was invited, you know, I wasn't in the finals. I was just there as a, as a guest and, uh, they had a buffet and Joey was full. Joey had just eaten 102 hamburgers, Joey Chestnut. <laughs> Kobayashi was there. He'd eaten about 101. You know, I forget who won that year. They were always back and forth. They were literally full. They were just sitting there full. Um, but everybody else, well, especially Rich. Rich was going up to the buffet and getting more <laughs> uh, macaroni and pasta. And I'm like, how the heck are you doing this? You know, and drinking. You know, they they, they were drinking. You know, and uh, well, they was, they you know, ate enough to absorb friend. the alcohol. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's something. But uh, you know, those guys. It's it's a great. You know, I I got into it uh, just because I saw a contest and. It was right in front of me. It was a hot dog eating contest, and I was there with my kids, and I thought, I'm going to jump in that thing. And I finished, like, fifth, my first contest, and I thought, okay, this is fun. So then I just did it once in a while. Got, I don't know if serious is the word, but I did it by height. I did maybe seven or eight contests a year. And now I'll do it maybe once if they're in Atlanta, if it's on a Saturday when I'm not working my regular job, just to see everybody get up there and give up, give, get a pathetic total, like 10 hot dogs in eight minutes <laughs> and, uh, and just wave to the crowd and say hi to my friends and go back home. And thanks again, Paul, for hanging out with us. It's always been a pleasure talking with you. Well, thank you, Joe. And, uh, like I said, if anybody wants to find out more about my nonsense, just Google me, Paul Barlow Jr. And you'll see my IMDB page come up. Uh, some videos, you know, I also am a, now a Donald Trump impersonator that may come up. So, yeah. So basically when people see what I've done on Google, they'll shake their head and they'll go, what is wrong with that guy? <laughs> and as always, we will post links to all of this on our social media. So check out our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter, and you'll see Paul's YouTube channel. We'll have, <laughs> we'll have photos and everything, links to the IMDB page. But we will have another full-length episode of the Above Average Show Show for you next week. Stay tuned, guys. Thanks. Can't wait. Thank you again to our special guest, Paul Barlow. Huge thank you to Courtney Chen for providing audio clips of her voice acting skills as Belle in the Vampire Batman faux Marshall. And a special shout out thanks to Addison for all her assistance on this episode. Be sure to check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitters and look us up on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. You can also check out another podcast I co-host, The Extra and Ordinary, and some other great media content by Moon Possum Productions at moonpossum.com. Yeah, thanks. Sort of. <laughs>